Okay, let's get going. Um, good morning, everybody. For a Sunday morning at 9.30, uh, this is the dedicated people that come along. So thanks so much. Um, my name's Elwin Granger-Jones. I'm going to moderate this morning. Um, I'm the uh, Director for Policy and Operations at the Global Environment Facility in Washington, D.C. But until recently, I was leading uh, IFAD's Climate and Environment uh, Department, uh, where I set up ASAP, the Adaptation for Smallholder Agriculture Program, amongst other things. So that's why I know people in this crowd and why I was asked to moderate. Um, I should also thank the co-host to this event, uh, which is CJR, in particular CCAS, uh, CTA, uh, CDKN, CDKN, FanPran, and PricewaterhouseCoopers, who have done a great job putting this together. Now, the format is very informal, particularly because we haven't got a packed room. I think we can actually have a nice conversation amongst ourselves. So really, I want to turn to you and have your questions and discussion and, and make this actually a, a relaxed affair, especially because it's, it's a Sunday morning. So please be ready to come in with questions. People I know, I'll be putting you on the spot. Others, please just you know raise your hand and, 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 and contribute to the discussion. But please be concise, because the worst thing in these things is if there are like five-minute questions. Um, so the morning is uh, it's pretty clear. I think uh, um, it, it is uh, some opening remarks. I think Peter's not here, right? So uh, Tony Simons will be opening. Um, and uh, then we have um, uh, opening remarks also from Marion Guillo, um, the president of, of uh, Greenham and a member of the CJR Consortium Board. And then Sam Bickersteth from PwC, who's going to tell us all about the INDCs. Um, and we may have a few moments for Q&A there. And then we break into a really fantastic panel. And I'll introduce that when we get to it. But that's where we really focus in on the INDCs and really get under the skin, I hope, of, uh, of, of what's going on, what we can read from uh, the INDCs that have been produced. And then we have an hour-long coffee break, which is kind of a long coffee break, but there we go. Um, and then there is a high-level panel um, with some great speakers. There might not be time for Q&A in that bit. Uh, we'll see how long people speak. Um, and, uh, and we have a poet in residence who's going to say something then. So uh, that will be interesting. And then we have a discussion on gender inequality and INDCs, or, or more broadly, social issue and INDCs. And Michael will finish. So that's the, uh, that's the format for the morning. And um, why don't we uh, start things off with a nice audiovisual presentation, and then we'll go on to the opening remarks. <laughs>
Okay, that was beautiful. Right, let's have uh, our first three uh, speakers. Uh, Tony, thank you so much. Oh, what? Starting again. Okay, Tony and uh, Marion. Okay, why don't, you, why don't you sit at the front and, and we'll have three of you and, and, and Sam you sit at the front and then uh, we will start with Tony to say a few opening remarks and then turn to Marion and then Sam will be telling us about INDCs. Good morning, everyone, and uh, apologies that uh, you don't see Peter Holmgren in front of you. He's been delayed and has asked me to, to step in and, and share some words on his behalf. Um, Peter Holmgren is the Director General of the Centre for International Forestry Research, C4, based in Indonesia, that is the, the driving force behind this whole Global Landscape Forum. Um, <clears throat> I'm Tony Simons, the Director General of the World Agroforestry Centre, a, a partner centre, one of the CGR centres with C4, and the CGR is often accused of over-exaggeration. And we will allow the, the 800 people in this room and the 10 million viewers online to decide if that's the case or not. From farmers' fields to landscapes, this is a, a session all about scale. Not only geographic scale, but scale of ambition and scale of implementation. We're going to hear about the INDCs. 183 of them have been submitted. There's only 12 who are yet to submit. One has declared they will not submit, and we're hoping the other 11 will contribute. The INDCs, I mean, I thought the CGR was good at acronyms, but UNFCCC is equally as good. The Intended Nationally Determined Contributions. And it's always nice to point fingers at other countries and nice to point fingers at other institutions, but the INDCs is meant to be a bottom-up process where, where there's national recognition. But even if countries have these wonderful uh, ambitions and these intentions, it's going to mean nothing if the consumers and the 7.3 billion people on our planet do not also make a contribution. And so perhaps we could all invent another acronym, um, and that would be the personal equivalent of INDCs, the, not the intended, but the unintended, personally undetermined threats, otherwise known as the you puts. So you put your house in order before you expect us to do the same. So we're going to hear in this session today about how Private sector partners, public sector partners, various institutions can look for new opportunities to work around technical assistance and around financing options. Because we know that agriculture is one of those few things that is both a, a victim of climate change, but also a bit of a villain. And we're hoping we can come up with some ideas to make it a little bit less of a villain and a little bit less of a victim. Because we know that, that one sector or one commodity, or one stakeholder is not going to fix that problem. It's going to be about partnerships. And so we would ask you all for you to put your house in order as well. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Tony had, uh, he had five minutes warning for that speech. Amazing. You just did that off the cuff. Um, thank you so much. Um, Marianne uh, uh, guilou Chapin is the president of uh, Agrinium and... Uh, which is a public consortium that promotes the role of research and higher education on food security and sustainable development, but has a long history in this area, was um, president and CEO of the French National Institute for Agricultural Research, and uh, is deeply involved in CCAS and the CJR, and, uh, and also the Committee on Food Security. So welcome. Thank you very much. So it's quite a challenge uh, during this forum uh, because we work on Sunday morning very early, so obviously you are the most courageous ones, and I welcome you. So, in fact, what are we going to do during that forum? I think it's quite challenging. We hope, we all hope, that in the agreement, 
there will be a part dedicated to agriculture. We heard yesterday night from uh, Maria Elena Semedo that uh, food security was mentioned in the preamble, and we hope that there will be more. So, in fact, at the moment, you talked about INDC, open, opens as well, if I understood well, but uh, maybe we will be a few of us to submit. But at the moment, we have INDCs, and in fact, most of them do reflect the importance of agriculture um, mitigation and adaptation. When I will talk about agriculture, it's agriculture in a wide sense. That is to, uh, that is to say agriculture, forestry, land use, and food and food systems. And so the sound implementation of the actions outlined is in INDCs are key which appropriate technical assistance and climate finance will need to be mobilized? What is the estimated finance needed for realizing adaptation and mitigation actions outlined in the INDC? How can we ensure that the farmers, and especially the smallholder farmers who need it most, get access to finance? What do we need for supporting women farmers and gender equality in technical assistance and financing. In terms of technical assistance, what is needed for countries, public and private partners and farmers to get going? In fact, the CGIAR system for itself is committed to dedicate 60% of its research for development effort to climate smart agriculture. More globally, how can this be aligned with the needs of countries and farmers in implementing the INDCs? So today's event brings together our partners, including public and private ones, and I insist on private ones so that they feel welcomed in our public organization, including farmers' organization, NGOs, international and national organizations, private sector and the research community. So what policies and partnerships are needed to support implementation and to achieve scale? Partic particularly, how can we address the growing number of smallholders farms expected to reach 750 million by 2030? How do we make sure gender and youth issues is not just lip service? In fact, the CGIAR system will help implement and support initiatives that ensure agriculture plays its part in climate change adaptation and mitigation under the UN process. This includes joining Cat pour Mille initiative, which was launched recently last week in Paris by co a coalition of French research agencies, but uh, more than 100 very diverse partners as well. The idea is to restore soils and soil carbon. And you know that the magnitude of order of the losses of soil, ca soil carbon from the soils are huge at the moment. So the initiative is a good example of how both mitigation and adaptation can be synergistic. So what other actions do you suggest? We now know that incremental or systemic changes will most likely not be sufficient, that we will need transformation adaptation in agricultural system. We will need innovation. We will need change. So are the INDCs actually transformational or just too identical, too more of the same? So there will be three interlinked sessions to answer this question during the day. And we hope to achieve the following outcomes. So now it's up to you to try to build those outcomes. First, to identify key issues and gaps in implementing INDCs, both in terms of technical capacity and access to climate finance, to identify ways in which technical capacity and financing gaps may be addressed, including, of course, the CGIAR 
roles in these efforts, identify ways to ensure that gender and youth issues are at the core of INDC implementation, and understand if changes proposed at the moment in INDCs are transformational enough, of, or if not, how can those more transformational changes can be achieved in our sector globally. So it's a lot of work on the table, and now it's up to you. Thank you, Marianne. Uh, let me introduce Sam Bickersteth. He's the Chief Executive of the Climate and Development Knowledge Network, CDKN, uh, which he's led since its inception in 2011. Um, he's an agricultural economist by training, and uh, we worked together in DFID for some years. Um, and uh, so as part of his role, uh, the CDKN is hosted by PricewaterhouseCoopers. Um, and uh, Sam has promised me he's read the HINDC uh, cover to cover. Isn't that right? So we're going to hear from you about that now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Erwin. And thank you, everybody, for managing to get here on a Sunday morning. So it's the GLF, isn't it? But we're actually here for COP21. And um, so we're trying to connect these two parts or not. Maybe a show of hands. How many people have a Blue Zone pass and have been into the negotiations this week? Quite a lot of you. How many of you have sat in an INDC conversation there? Oh, that's surprising. There are an awful lot of side meetings on INDCs. And so I'm not just going to talk to you about INDCs. I got five Cs I thought I'd throw at you. COP, we can do that quite quickly. It's just a minor diversion across Le Bourget. Um, consumption countries, INDCs. Um, cows and corporates, five Cs um, this morning. And uh, let's see how we go. Um, I've got no PowerPoints, you'll be pleased to know. I want this you to be engaged and um, uh, and and Really, we, I don't want to talk for too long. We want to have a conversation here this morning in this group. So thank you again for coming. Thank you to friends from CCAFs um, and others involved in this event for inviting PwC and CDKN to be part of it. Let's just remind ourselves, as Marin said, where the text has got to that uh, concluded yesterday, the, the ADP that goes forward into week two under the French presidency um, uh, today, meeting even today, I understand, to keep the ball rolling. The preamble does still make us good reference to food security uh, and ending hunger. And the Article 2, which is the purpose of the Convention, um, talks about the Convention's intention not to threaten food production and distribution. Food production and distribution. Not quite sure what that means. It seems a slightly limited definition of what we might be talking about here if we're moving from, we're talking about consumption as well. But when we get to Article 3, mitigation, uh, uh, food security and agriculture remains bracketed, as a lot of the text does. Um, and we get to Article 6 on finance, um, finance for sustainable development, food security and poverty reduction. All that remains in brackets. Wow, that's quite a lot, isn't it? Yeah, because kind of where do we come from? We come from conversations where, um, where we can't see a way forward on food security, adaptation, and mitigation without deep engagement with the agricultural sector. So we can stay at the GLF, or we can go across to Le Bourget, or we can try and connect the two, and we can make a decision as to the importance and the opportunities of those spaces to do so. But Tony gave a very nice hook here. We can go from INDCs, which in a way have been an amazing process, an incredible process that 183 parties have submitted um, INDCs, unexpected because they weren't obliged to do so. Um, and unexpectedly, they've, they've kind of brought agriculture in various ways into them by and large. But it's actually what happens in January, what happens on the 14th of December, post-COP, for national determined contributions. But Tony's challenge is to think about our personal contribution, our outputs uh, in this process. And that's why I wanted to touch on consumption. So Tony and I had a perfect planning beforehand to, to make sure we were well joined up. So let's just think about the crunch in food security that's coming up. And does that match up with the ambitions that we hope uh, uh, agreed over the next week at COP21? 
30 to 50 percent increase in demand of food by 2030. So you hear the 50 percent by 2050, but kind of nearer in over the 15 years, a giant increase need for access for, for food production for a rapidly growing world population. And as business as usual, that is as currently consumed, global meat consumption will rise by 75% by 2050, which would actually make it impossible to achieve the two degree target alone. So what are we actually doing about one of the biggest issues in front of us? Um, it will just exponentially rise. And I've spent a lot of time in conversations about energy systems this week, and we know that decarbonizing energy is the kind of thing that can be done. We're seeing decoupling in economies happening in advanced economies. There's a giant way to go in many others. But what are we doing about the food side of this? And where we start to look at maybe a, a change in consumption habits, perhaps with respect to meat and other aspects of the food systems, this is mostly happening in developed countries. But actually the demand increases on meat and for food for the billion hungry people is happening in developing countries, overwhelmingly from the developing world. So a lot of giant dots to kind of join up here to look at the emissions gap just in food and livestock alone. So just a reminder of the, of the facts here, um, agricultural forestry and land use makes up about 25%, as we've already heard from these excellent films, about 25% of GHG emissions at present, which is more than many other sectors, industry and transport and so on. Uh, and then when you add in the food trains, a chain and, and factor in emissions from the non-production emissions, consumption, refrigeration, waste and transport, we're really talking about 30% of global emissions. So th we, th this is what we're talking about this morning, 30% of global emissions. Yeah, are we connecting that to things in brackets in the text? I do want to make that point. Um, and of course, a sizable part of these emissions come from a, a somewhat unnecessary and totally unsustainable. Nearly twice as many people globally overweight uh, 1.9 billion overweight adults worldwide, twice as many as the number who are undernourished. A third of food is still wasted. Um, so you know, you're very familiar with these statistics. I'm throwing them out to keep you awake on a, on a cheerful Sunday morning. But, um, but they, really, they really matter. Maybe we look at it from the other side. There's a great World Bank report that Stefan Halligat was presenting at a forum I was at yesterday. Um, it's, it's, it's called, I'll just see if I can make sure I reference it, Shockwaves, Managing the Impacts of Climate Change on Poverty. You might be aware this is the one which talks about 100 million going back into poverty if we don't stay within two degrees. Good report. And agriculture is referenced quite a lot in that report, um, as it is. And it talks a lot about transitory poverty, people coming out of poverty, people falling back into poverty, and climate drivers that will increase that. And when, you, when they disaggregated some of the statistics of the poor and non-poor in Nigeria, they found that um, poor people were 130% more likely to be affected by drought in that country than non-poor. 130% more likely if you're a poor person to be affected by drought. It's fairly obvious. We know that poor people are highly vulnerable to shocks. Um, but many of those people are going to be in the agricultural community. So when we look at solutions, and I thought this was a great set of videos because it moved us from the gloomy to the solutions, and that's a really important part of the narrative that CCAFs and others have been promoting very strongly. We can't really talk about low carbon, climate resilient um, development without talking about climate smart agriculture. It's normally on the list of things to do. And actually, when you go across to Le Bourget, uh, there are an awful lot of conversations about climate smart agriculture, both in the corporates pavilions and, and some of the country pavilions, which happen to be next to each other, the Africa pavilion and the Aita pavilion, back one to another. And they both had events on CSA over in the, in the first week of the COP. So it's quite interesting. So agriculture sits at the heart of this, and where are the solutions? That's what I think got us up this Sunday morning to come and think about. So um, I was billed to talk about the INDCs, yes, what happens at country level. Uh, there is actually a paper which CCAF's colleagues have produced, which is sitting certainly on some tables here, and I don't intend to go through it all. Um, but yes, they do address agriculture, and that's quite interesting. I don't think that was obviously 
going to happen uh, initially. 80% um, of them actually refer to agriculture in some form of the 183 um, INDCs that have already been referred to. Um, and 80% of them including in some way in their mitigation targets and 60% in their adaptation targets. Um, but of course, it's not clear quite how this will happen. INDCs, Intended Nationally Determined Contributions, are of variable length and quality um, and credibility. In fact, there's a, there's, a, there's a political credibility analysis of INDCs out from the Grantham Institute in London, which is being presented on Tuesday here in Paris. But some of them are, are well thought through. I mean, in the case of Ethiopia, um, they've outlined that livestock and crop cultivation is responsible for half of emissions in 2010 and highlights the need for support around that. It's land use management in Ethiopia uh, and the completion of the Renaissance Dam to drive their massive um, renewable power capabilities that will enable them to achieve 64% emissions reductions uh, by 2030. Um, in the 2050, I believe it is actually, uh, in their INDC. One of the most ambitious INDCs comes from uh, a, that least developed country. Uh, and agriculture and livestock and land use management sits at the heart of their capability to do that. But they're going to need financial support. In Bangladesh, there's in Bangladesh's INDC, proposed uh, pro various in um, incremental measures around agriculture, which again were contingent on international support. They have a 5% unconditional, 15% uh, conditional uh, INDC uh, in terms of the emissions reduction. Um, and they see uh, the potential to shift the share of organic versus inorganic fertilizer by a big, big chunk, by 35%. So that shifting that ratio is one of the things they see as, as a measure they can take. Jump to Brazil, which is the third, large, third largest agriculture uh, emitter and restoring 15 million hectares of degraded pasture by 2030. So it's this whole land use forestry uh, interface in Brazil sits very much at the heart of their ambitious number, which is I think in the mid 40s for emissions reduction. So lots mention agriculture, lots mention food security. Some go into some detail, those three I've highlighted there. But real difficulty with actually getting the numbers. Um, the organization I had, CDKN, supported some 10 countries in preparation of their INDCs, uh, one of which was Bangladesh. And they were essentially not able to set out uh, in their targets their emissions reductions ambition in agriculture. The data wasn't good enough. Um, and this was my fear early on when the first INDCs were being prepared that agriculture would be left out of it because of the long-standing arguments about MRV for land use, you know, the methodological challenges uh, and the data challenges. So that comes through in the agriculture INDC. So the challenge in Bangladesh to, to a certain extent uh, post-COP is actually to increase the, the, the quality of the data because the INDCs are only going to really work or the international process only work if there's adequate um, monitoring uh, review and verification. So MRV in land use and agriculture and the data behind this really is, is, is quite a challenge going ahead. So final word on what it's all going to cost. Um, according to our friends in CCAFs, um, their analysis is showing that delivering against the ambitions in the agriculture sector as set out in the INDCs, it might cost 5 billion US dollars per year. Um, and that's a big number. Um, uh, that's not a number that's available, and that's not a number that matches what's happened in terms of climate finance support to agriculture so far. Agriculture has received less than forestry even uh, from climate finance. Some, one of the analysis shows that 70% of multilateral climate funds has gone to agriculture, um, which is a very small proportion if we're saying agriculture is one of where the area is solutions, where there's huge adaptation demands uh, and potential in mitigation why is so little climate finance flowing to this sector? The INDC is now setting this out. First look is saying this is going to cost about $5 billion. How is the money going to flow? The money is only going to flow if it comes from the private sector and other sources. Climate finance will come from domestic resources. It will come from private um, sector investment, uh, whether it's smallholders or corporates, uh, and it will also come from domestic resource uh, mobilization by countries themselves. And many countries... Um, such as Uganda, uh, where we've been working recently, are putting considerable resources 
into this themselves in their own domestic resources. So climate finance is a challenge for the INDCs. So what needs to be done? Um, well, let's look at it. Let's look at it in different ways. Of course, we can produce differently, and the INDCs do touch on this to a certain extent. Um, we can change how food is grown and reared, improve resource efficiency, um, increase productivity, reduce environmental impact. Even these images here start to give us some some windows on this. Um, but let's not get fixated in the solution just sitting in the production box. And I think um, you know that's where I've been most of my career, and many of us here have been much in that. It's great to be with some of the other organizations here who are thinking about other aspects of the food supply chain, the storage and transport. What can we do in terms of efficient storage and logistics to reduce waste uh, and improve infrastructure at rural level and into cities? Are we distributing and selling stuff in the right way? Are we marketing uh, the nutritional value or the carbon um, uh, footprint of our food? Um, you know, th th I raised this issue about, about food waste um, and overnourishment or overconsumption of food already. So on the business side, we do see some initiatives going, going ahead here. There's this uh, tool that being it's been used, started up by Unilever and now being used by PepsiCo, Tesco and Heineken, the Cool Farm tool, which some of you may be aware of, which is a greenhouse gas calculator for corporates um, uh, in the agricultural sector, which helps measure carbon footprint from crop and livestock products. So the, there are tools out there. And what about um, meat? Um, uh, uh, I said I'd mentioned cows. Um, you may have seen the recent Chatham House report on this topic that got picked up to a certain extent in the British media. And some of the analysis behind that suggests that people are happy for governments to regulate to a limited extent to shift behavior in relation to meat consumption. We accepted a change in behavior around smoking. The report suggests um, shifting uh, consumption hab habits um, through regulation, or is it pricing, um, or a meat tax? This was the concept that the Chatham House report put forward. Um, so how do we incentivize this shift, really, uh, from the consumer side, from the way that corporates and businesses um, deal with this? In forestry, we've seen the Consumer Goods Forum, uh, and we've seen corporates step forward with zero net deforestation by 2020. Uh, so we're seeing this happening in the forestry side. Where are we going in agriculture? It's just, just to continue with my, my cow theme um, a little bit longer, and I promise I won't, won't dwell on it very much longer, but um, meat eaters um, contribute a lot of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, Seven kilograms of CO2 equivalent per day uh, is the figure for a high meat eater uh, compared to 4.7 for a, a low meat eater. So we can lower our emissions by a third just by cutting down on our meat consumption, not giving up. You know, we can turn vegan and go lower. We can turn vegetarian. Well, vegetarian uh, and vegan is the kind of lowest sort of emissions. Um, but we don't actually have to give up meat to start to do uh, what Tony called to address our U, U inputs. So there is a consumption opportunity. And I think the chat, looping back to the Chatham House uh, report is there's a sense that regulation, um, taxation, uh, labeling, and so on can help shift us in that direction. Of course, there is the production side and the political economy of this. The average cow in... Um, OECD countries uh, is getting $190 a year uh, subsidy. It's quite a lot of public money tied up in every cow standing in a field. $53 billion uh, were livestock subsidies in 34 OECD countries. We could shift that to climate change action, couldn't we? That's a lot of money, frankly, in the wrong place. It would affect the price of our meat. Of course it would. It would affect the livelihoods of many farmers. Of course it would. But is that the most efficient way of tackling these dual challenges of adaptation, mitigation, and global food security? So consumption linked to production, linked to climate change, linked to, of course, the political economy of winners and losers in this. One of the points I've made frequently about INDCs is if, if, an IND, if these 183 INDCs have been developed at national level, because they have been nationally driven, of course, 
and they've been done without anybody coming out of it with any bruises, have they been a worthwhile INDC? <coughs> INDCs should be a difficult process. Of course there's win-win out there, but there's win-lose, and not everybody is going to come out of this. Um, and um, the, the case in which we've worked as CDKN in, in some depth, which is the INDC in Peru, is particularly interesting. In Peru, over several years, um, the moderator's probably going to tell me to stop soon. He's coming close. Um, in Peru, um, Plan CC, which is the Climate Change Mitigation Plan, identified 77 mitigation options, um, uh, which are quite specific, some hugely challenging into, into do with forest management and changing um, uh, forest loss, uh, which, is, which is a giant problem still in Peru. Others were trying to change the light bulbs in the, in the whole of um, Lima. Um, and in the end, they put 11 forward into their INDC uh, 11 actions, so quite specific things. And when it finally came to it, that went out to public consultation in a very open, typically um, Latin American process uh, for the INDC. When it was finally submitted, they didn't name those 11 because they couldn't resolve it. Why couldn't they resolve it? Because there's that political economy. There are, the people are fighting their corner about who's going to win and lose uh, in that process. So we have to accept that this is a change. The transformation that's necessary is a change in, in, in which um, we're getting deeply involved in social and political issues, and agriculture doesn't escape from that, as you all know very, very well. So let me just jump to, to where are corporates, uh, one part of corporates. There are others here can, who can speak to that. Um, uh, I, I don't feel have any particular truth on this. PwC, uh, where I work, uh, has been working with a group of CEOs from the World Business Council for Sustainable Development around an initiative called the Low Carbon Technology Partnership Initiative, LCTPI, one of those acronyms to, to take away. LCTPI is a public-private partnership to accelerate low carbon technology development um, and has involved um, some 200 international companies looking at the relationship between the uh, growth, um, social and econo ecological balance, sort of triple bottom line, as some might call it, and trying to accelerate technology transfer in this space. Um, and uh, PwC is supported um, uh, with looking at agricultural climate risk on crop failure with, with modelling around various key commodities in supply chains of these corporates. And the point to make about LCTPI and the WBCSD, who have a major day tomorrow, actually, here at the COP, um, is that creating these coalitions of willing businesses will drive the process. So the INDCs, by and large, have been fairly private sector um, blind. Um, they, some have, inc you know, have incorporated them adequately, but many haven't, um, have been government-led. We can't get there if we just focus on countries and national governments. We have to work with corporates too. So I wanted to wrap up uh, looking over this sort of review of where we are on the COP, where we are with the huge challenges um, in the agriculture sector, notably uh, in the livestock zone, um, thinking about INDCs, a national level, and the role of the private sector is first the news is good. The INDCs have anchored in agriculture and food security, by and large. We can see that. The quality of that is variable, but I think the door is open. We'll see how the text goes in the COP. And for those of who worked in this field, I don't think we should worry too much about that because we, we need to press on in this direction. The INDCs will bend the emissions curve by 25% of where we need to be by... Um, um, by by 2030, but there's still a giant gap. We're only um, less than a third of the way there uh, in terms of staying within two degrees. You've seen the data. The emissions gap report talks about three to three and a point five degrees with what the INDCs present. Forestry and land use, forestry in particular, more strongly than agriculture, is a major contributor, and it's set out there in the INDCs as part of that means of bending the curve. But we're only really picking the low-hanging fruit in the tree, and we've got to climb the tree to get to the more challenging parts of getting to back to ratcheting up towards achieving the two degrees. Yep. And agriculture is going to sit there. We've talked about that. Livestock issues are going to sit there very much. 
So at the moment, I think we know there are some early wins in some of the technologies around agroforestry and, uh, and, 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 and other aspects in, in, in reducing emissions in the sector. But I think we've got a long way to go to climb the trees to, to really bend the curve in terms of emissions in the face of agriculture. And if we only look at the production side, we're going to miss the point. We have to look at the consumption side, tackling this in, in, with respect to both um, food crop production and livestock. To do this, we're going to need new skills. I don't know how many of you come from a marketing background in here. How many of you are looking at regulation? We need to change consumer behavior. So I come from the production side. I'm an agricultural economist. I work with the CGIAR and, and other institutions over the years, and I've... I don't think I've got all those skills. I'd be quite honest about that. So we need to br bring in new partners to achieve these challenges. And I think if we accept that climate change is a development, program, a development problem, which I think we've all accepted really here, and that food security sits at the heart of this, what we need to do coming out of Paris is to reach out to new communities, to bring in new sets of skills to, uh, to bolster this effort um, to, to take actions around climate smart agriculture, around agriculture, land use, uh, and food systems um, in the context of uh, a, a changing climate. So with these words, an agitated Elwin, I will stop. Thank you very much. <laughs> you read my body language, thank you. Thank you, Sam, for a great presentation. Uh, much appreciated. I just wanted to make sure we have time to move on to our panel. Um, so. If the panel could uh, 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 please come to the stage, that's Sunny, um, Anna, Paula, Tavares, Theo, and Martin. Just please take a seat up here. We will be drawing on um, on Sam in the in the in the discussion as well um, to to perhaps follow up on some of those points. Um, but let me introduce the panel. We've got a fantastic panel. Um, Going from uh, right to left, the way I'm facing, uh, we have uh, uh, Mr. Sunny Vergesse, who is the co-founder, group managing director, and CEO of Olam International, which really doesn't need much introduction. I think everyone here knows Olam and knows quite, a, quite what a, a, a significant player they are in this space. Um, but, uh, but Sunny um, uh, is... Uh, is presently chairman of the board, uh, also of the Human Capital Leadership Institute, Singapore, served on the boards of International Enterprise Singapore, board of trustees of the National University, was the first chairman of City Spring Infrastructure Management Limited, and served on the main e economic review committee uh, of the Singapore government um, for its economic blueprint in 2001, and has won so many awards, I won't even start listing them here. Uh, so welcome, Sunny, thanks for, thanks for joining us. Um, we have Anna uh, Paula Tavares, who is the, uh, the president of the Rainforest Alliance, uh, and has been with that organization 15 years, so extremely loyal. Um, and uh, she, uh, well, everyone knows what the Rainforest Alliance is as well, but she was also the founding partner at New Frontiers Group, a financial services group in Sao Paulo, Brazil, um, which promoted investment funds for biodiversity, sustainable forestry, carbon sequestration, and renewable energy and was also the Director of Science Development at the New York Botanical Garden. Um, we have Martin Crick, who's standing in for uh, Maria Helena Semedo, who is unwell. Martin is the, well, not so new now, actually, but uh, um, relatively recently joined FAO as the, uh, the uh, I believe, the Director of the Climate and, uh, and uh, the Climate Group in FAO. Uh, um, so welcome, and thanks for coming at short notice. And then uh, Theo de, uh, de Jagger, who is the um, deputy president of uh, uh, AgriSA, um, which is the, a federation of agricultural organizations in South Africa. Um, and uh, he's also president of the South African Confederation of Agricultural Unions, SACAO, and the president of the Pan-African Farmers Association. And um, also is, has a, a real farm, and a big one, I'm told. So welcome. Thanks so much for coming. Um, now, let me turn to you. Uh, I've got a bunch of questions I want to ask these people, but uh, I'd rather it starts with you. And by the way, the people that have come in uh, since we started, if you can move forward a bit, if any of you feel brave enough just to come and sit around here a bit more, it, it, uh, if you want to come up, if you want an upgrade to, to business class, come and sit around here, and then you'll get your question in. 
and it will make us feel better because it will be a bit more crowded up here. So please move forward if you can. Right, let's just gather a few questions for this excellent panel. Uh, so who wants to start? I may just pick on someone if no one wants to step forward. So we have you know, representatives of pretty much all sectors to this problem. So you must have come here to learn something. What do you want to learn? Please. And if you could introduce yourself and please be concise with the question. Thanks. There's a mic there. Thank you. Gabriela from Monsanto. We are co-sharing the Climate Smart Agriculture with Olam. Then very good to have Olam here, the Chief Executive Officer. Thank you. Thank you also for the great presentation before. My question is related to climate smart agriculture and all this discussion. How can we go more in terms of science and action that's necessary and leave all the questions about uh, the opportunity and agroforestry? How can we be more effective in this process considering that we really need to act now? Thank you. Thanks very much. Let's gather a couple, couple more questions, please. Bruce. Uh, Bruce Campbell from CTX. Um, <coughs> so we heard, heard that the, um, the INDCs are very nationally driven, and then the WBSCD has a, a great initiative on the private sector. How do, how do those two things come together? And perhaps I could ask a private sector and a public sector person to respond. Thank you, Bruce, and this gentleman behind you. Uh, my name is Marcus, I'm from Organics International, and I would like to know from the panel the potentials of agroecological methods, particularly in terms of carbon soil sequestration. You heard the Catapumil initiative. So where do you see actually potential when farmers going, farmers uh, driven bottom-up processes in agroecological process? Thank you, and uh, gentlemen. Yeah, thank you. My name's John Rexage. I was director of uh, climate change uh, with the International Institute for Sustainable Development, but I'm uh, representing the International Fertilizer uh, Industry Association here in these processes. I just want to make two observations that may be also in the form of a question. Sam, it was a great presentation. Um, in terms of agriculture's profile in these negotiations, it's always almost been like the orphan. It was part of bunker fuels for the longest time, continuously marginalized. And we still have an awful lot of challenges in terms of how it's going to be addressed um, here, in, not only here in Paris, but thereafter. It's the one significant sector that continues to uh, be challenged by, uh, when you see all of the activities going around here, there's a massive gap between the UNFCC process and where they are in agriculture and where the landscape activities are and, and many others. So I'm just wondering people's reflections, in fact, on how we can more in fact effectively engage agriculture in the UNFCC process. Uh, the second point I want to make is in the <coughs> number of presentations this morning, the one thing that I find striking is that we've heard a lot about INDCs, but nothing about SDGs. And food security is, after poverty eradication, the number two goal in the sustainable development goal process. There's a presentation before Sam talking about how youth and innovation need to be a core part, and I would agree, but I would suggest that in fact, within the INDCs, let's focus on the climate change component and make sure that in fact it's developed and designed in such a way that it takes into account these broader issues that are covered under the SDGs, and it's important that we keep those two clarified. Thank you. Okay, well that's a good start off. Um, why don't we uh, bring our panel in? Um, Sonny, do you want to do you want to kick off? And it would be great in your uh, in your comments if you could perhaps say a little bit about the uh, two degrees uh, Celsius call to world leaders that Olam has made at this conference too. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Uh, thank you, Evelyn. Thank you for all those uh, very interesting and insightful questions. Uh, to take first the uh, point that uh, Evelyn was making about our call for uh, to the industry and to government and policymakers to uh, take action to limit uh, global temperature rise by two degrees centigrade. I think it is driven mainly by the fact that uh, according to the WBSED, the World Business Council on Sustainable Development, uh, there is a need to reduce carbon dioxide emissions from agriculture, which today, as Sam mentioned, accounts for about 25% of all greenhouse gas emissions by 1.6 gigatons per year, which is roughly uh, 1.6 gigatons, which is roughly a reduction of about 30% from the current 
carbon dioxide emissions that we have from the agricultural sector by 2030, and to further reduce it by about 50% by 2050, which means about 2.8 gigatons of carbon dioxide equivalent emissions per year. That is a huge task. Uh, and if you don't achieve at least one gigaton, you're not likely to reach or uh, meet the target of two degrees centigrade rise. And that's very important. Uh, true cost, which most of you would have heard of, uh, in October published a study which says that natural capital costs in agriculture, in crop production, is estimated at about $1.15 trillion. That is about 170% of the value of all crop production in the world. And because Mother Nature's back office is not set up and is not issuing us those invoices for our carbon dioxide emissions or for our water footprint or for our bio waste footprint, uh, this is not being costed. On livestock, it is $1.81 trillion. And that is almost 134% uh, of the value of all livestock production. So if you really priced carbon and really priced water at a fair value and really price the pollution that is being generated in farming and agricultural systems, then that is $2.98 trillion. And in the case of livestock production, about 77% of that, so in the case of crop production, 77% of all this natural capital cost that we incur is actually happening on the farm. And only the balance, roughly 36%, happens upstream in the inputs that go into livestock production. In the case of crop production, 77% of all these natural costs that we incur actually happens on the farm. So we can sit here 50 years down the road and beat our chest and say, why the hell didn't things change? It will not change unless we price carbon, unless we price water at a fair level, unless we price pollution, 97% of all the surface water in China is contaminated. China uses about 360 kilograms of fertilizer per hectare against, say, the US of 138, against European Union of 200. No wonder most of Chinese surface water, 97% is contaminated. So unless we are going to price it, behavior is not going to change. And unless we actually footprint our carbon use or carbon dioxide emissions or a water emission, a water usage or a bio-waste pollution footprint, we are not going to make any change. Thank you, Sunny. So, you know, you're, you're really calling for effective government regulation to, to solve this market failure. In a sense, that's what Olam needs to, to be able to actually uh, fully respond to the, uh, the challenge out there, right? I, I think government regulation would help, but I don't think we can wait for it. Uh, by the time policymakers come around to realizing the seriousness of this issue, I think we've lost very, very valuable time. So I think companies have, have to take the lead as well to first footprint what is their carbon dioxide emissions. And it has took us six years across the 65 countries and 44 commodities that we deal in to do a footprinting exercise. And then we put out public hard targets, not because there was a government regulation or policy, but because we feel that we won't be able to sustain our future as a company, it is easy to go and get licenses from the governments in the countries that we operate to, to do business, but very difficult to get license from the communities to operate for the long term. Very difficult to get employees who want to work for you if you're not doing the right thing. So it'd be great if the governments can wake up and act, but we can't wait for that. So we have to do carbon footprinting, we have to do natural capital accounting, we have to price carbon. If you don't do all of these things, we can sit here 50 years down the road and talk about the same thing with no progress. You've, um, uh, you've really started all this work, but you'd get a boost if you had better government regulation. That's what you're saying. Well, it, it would help. But there is a fundamental dilemma for the governments. Because if you're going to tax, then you're going to increase the cost of food production. If you're going to increase the cost of pr food production, there are 804 million people going to bed hungry every day. You're going to increase that number. So how do you break this paradox? So how do we make sure that food is still affordable to the vulnerable parts of society, but at the same time, how do you sustainably grow more food to meet a growing demand? So if you put taxes, you're going to increase food production. So there has to be other ways of transferring and protecting, like the food stamp program in the US. If you look at the US Farm Bill that has just been passed, the 2015 farm, 2014 Farm Bill, $956 billion over the period of that farm bill. 
about $750 billion is for food stamps. So the OECD countries last year paid about $380 billion of farm subsidies. It's perverse and cannot be justified. So one way of making sure that the vulnerable sections of society, the 804 million hungry people, don't have to pay a higher price for food is to really change that. But that requires action which I don't foresee. There'll be political will or brave and courageous policy making. Uh, I don't see that happen. I'm gonna resist the temptation to keep asking more questions on this, but there may be some more on the floor for you. Theo, I'm told you're um, fairly involved in the negotiations and in, in, in tracking and following them. Um, so I know there was one question about how do we further increase the level of awareness in, in, this, in this climate negotiation and discussion space on, on the agriculture issue. And I wonder if you have anything to say on that point. I know there was also another question about um, you know, the actual agroecological methods. Uh, I think it was, uh, you know, are we, are we there yet in actually knowing what works and what doesn't work? And it is more the problem now the politics and the regulations and the policies and education, or are there still some big unknowns? about the actual methods out there, the methodologies. Please, there's a microphone there. Theo, I wonder if you could say a few things about that. Is it on? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, as, a, as a farmer, I sense amongst my colleagues, especially over the last few weeks, a growing frustration with this whole process. This morning, I sense a kind of an excitement that food security at least is mentioned. But where's agriculture? If, if we can make such a difference in the emissions, why are, aren't we mentioned more specifically? And we are not asking about the nuts and bolts of it. We are simply asking to be included under a substa where we can accumulate no more knowledge and wisdom as to how to go about to ensure that we mitigate and also have, uh, or adapt and also have mitigation co-benefits. Because as we sit here, th there is no fraternity in the world who is more vulnerable to climate change than the farmers, especially those who, who I represent, the, the poorest of the poor, the, the African smallholder farmers. And there's also no fraternity in the world who can do more to decrease emissions over the shorter space of time in a cheaper way than we can. And just having a reference to food security in the text is simply not enough. We do not understand why we are not included. No one ever tells us this party or that group is against it. We've never been explained why agriculture has been left out. And we want to know. We want to know in terms of this 80% of countries who, who committed um, to, to make a difference in agriculture too. How they, 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 they plan to do it without engaging the farmers themselves. We have structures today on, on my continent, from the continental to the regional, right down to smallholder level in cooperatives. There where the farming really takes place and we can communicate with them in one day down to, to grassroots level and back again. It is relatively easy today to get into the hearts and into the minds of the individual farmer on grassroots level. M makes me wonder is the time not right to go past these individual national commitments to sectoral commitments too? Only end of last week, we had a conference which, which CTA facilitated where we had probably the most representative groups of farmers leaders on the continent together. Literally from Cape to Cairo and from Madagascar to Morocco. And I know it's only the African farmers, but uh, it's, it's a huge chunk of the farming population in the developing world. And when we discussed this, it was the farmers themselves who said, let's not only demand to be included, but
But let's also commit towards each other and actually police each other to what we can do to, to adapt and mitigate. Theo, that's great. Just to, just to understand um, what you would like to see from this negotiation process is, just could you clarify a bit more, what, what would he actually like to see? You mentioned sectoral commitments, you know, beyond, concretely, what, 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 would, be, what would be your dream? At least include agriculture in the same way in which forestry is included. For many of us, well, from a farmer's perspective, you know, those of us who live in forests or those of us who grow forests or those of us who have forests in our area, there, there's no real difference between th th this is where the forestry stops and this is where the, the, the agriculture starts. I, I'm a, a forester as a farmer. Um, include agriculture in the same way as, as, as forestry has been included. And all, let's also launch special programs. Forestry has got red and red plus. I, include us in the same way as food and fiber producers. Thanks, thanks. If I could briefly bring in our other panel members, but then there'll be a bunch more questions. I'd like you to further engage on those. Was there anything on these points you wanted to add on these other questions? Yeah, okay. Um, Martin. Yeah, thank you. Maybe it's worthwhile to say a couple of words about the negotiations and the INDCs, because there is a blurred line, and I think we need to, to clarify what was happening. So roughly speaking, before Copenhagen, there was the idea of there would be a top-down legal instrument that would trickle down to the nation states and then end up in regulations. And since many, many countries earned their income from exporting and producing food, there was strong resistance to include agriculture. That's a bit of the heritage. Now, as we all know, Copenhagen collapsed and the revival of the climate negotiations turned around the logic to a bottom-up approach. Now we have the INDCs. The INDCs are an expression of national sovereignty. The member states can define themselves what they want to do. And of course, they feel much more comfortable defining on the basis of the national sovereignty. So now in the INDCs, suddenly agriculture is all over the place. We heard in detail about 80% of the INDCs covering that. We were at FAO also monitoring the INDCs and there is an interesting little detail, which is the wave of the INDCs really came in literally in the last days before the deadline. So many of these INDCs have been, were done under tremendous political pressure, often from prime minister and president's office, and now they are out there. It is changing the dynamic tremendously. You have agriculture now all over the place, but from the bottom up, and at the same time, you got many commitments, and it was mentioned before, many of them conditional. So where are we? I think this COP is really interesting because it breaks the old Annex 1, non-Annex 1 countries. We are finally in a space where we agree that globally everybody has to contribute. So we should be very grateful, particularly for the least developed countries, to participate in this process and to have their INDCs put forward. And we have to honor this commitment by bringing climate finance into their sectors. And their sectors are the agricultural sectors. So I think if we want them to become in the mainstream negotiations, as on the same level like forestry, it's the same logic. Forestry is there because there was always the perspective of money being transferred to honor good forestry practices. Now we get the INDCs and countries are coming forward and say we are prepared to do the right thing if you put money on the table. You mentioned five billion missing. Well, by sheer coincidence, that's exactly the amount of money which is in the Green Climate Fund, which after 11 board meetings managed to spend 1.7% of the money that is in the bank. Well, I think we have a very good proposal where the rest of the money ought to be going. Thank you. Thanks, and we could have a excellent all-day discussion uh, on MRV in agriculture to, and how that compares to forestry, but I don't think we've got time for that. I want to bring Anna in, but perhaps after the next round of questions, um, please, uh, let's, uh, all comments, please be concise. And I, if uh, uh, we propose to carry on a little bit longer than 10.30, since we have a luxurious one-hour coffee break, so we may just run on a bit, please. My name is Emil Frison. Uh, I want to reiterate the question that was asked before about the potential of agroecology, meaning a more radical change in our approach to agriculture, incorporating both mitigation at a serious level 
and uh, insisting also on the resilience dimension that these processes can bring. I would like to hear from the panel what they think the potential there is. Okay, please. Danush Dinesh from CCAPS. I actually have two questions. I, I see the, uh, with the convergence of different actors, we have farmers, we have technical assistants, certifiers, private sector, and you complete the picture with finance. So I w the question I have is, how do these different actors converge at a country level for our NDC implementation? And just sort of comments, you could also comment on that. I have a second question, and this could be for Sam or to Martin Frick, um, is what Ms. Gio raised this morning, are the INDCs actually transformational? Uh, and if they are not, what, what do we need to do to make it transformational? I think GCF also has the cri criteria for transformational projects, so maybe comment on that. Thank you. Let's take a couple more, and comments are good too. Please, this lady here. Hi, my name is Isabel Koch. I'm with the International Agri-Food Network. Um, one question I had was, I think the issue of carbon and carbon pricing is very interesting, partly because it's a very painful discussion. Um, since we have a farmer as well on the panel, I wondered if you would want to exchange a bit of views about how do we actually do this? Because you pointed out the problem when you start pricing carbon and pricing water adequately, oftentimes the farmers are the ones that are going to get hit hardest because the price will come down. And we've seen a lot of producers and manufacturers talking about it, but we haven't heard much from the farmers about how they feel about seeing carbon and water priced in a way that reflects their actual costs. Thank you. And this lady here. I'm Marianela Curi from uh, Latin American Future Foundation. Uh, and I, I want to ask the panel uh, about the how to improve the relationship between uh, protection and production. This relationship that traditionally has, has not been complementary between forestry and agriculture, and how to, to make this uh, or to um, uh, highlight the co-benefits of making a, a smart agriculture in terms of protecting forestries also. Thank you. Why don't we turn to our panel again? Anna, please comment on these or any of the other points before. And it would be great also to hear your views about, uh, given you come from Rainforest Alliance, about the extent to which um, certification standards can play a role in, in sort of making this transformation that we speak about. Thank you, and thank you all for joining us this morning. <coughs> and just to put into context, Rainforest Alliance is, we've, we've been working in this space, uh, whether we have called the, or not, on climate mitigation, adaptation, resilience for 28 years. So the potential for um, uh, uh, climate smart agriculture is, is huge. We are working with 1.2 million uh, farmers in about, well, when we're talking about farmers in, to talk about uh, sustainable agriculture and sustainable forestry as well. And really working to help with uh, a, a number of stakeholders to set up what is sustainable, what are, what are the, the best practices within forestry and agriculture. And then providing technical assistance to uh, smallholders in 80 plus countries when, um, when appropriate, certifying them. And then working with companies like Olam, but many others, Unilever, made, but, uh, thousands of companies throughout supply chains to, um, to link the sustainable products to the companies that have made these commitments, and then ultimately to the consumers. As you mentioned earlier today, it's not only about the production, but it's also we need, these are complex issues. So we have to use all, uh, we have to approach it in, in many ways. Uh, so also Rainforest Alliance working as we say it in our mission to protect biodiversity and and uh, and livelihoods and and promote sustainable livelihoods by transforming land use practices, business practices, and consumer behavior. So the role of of uh, certification in helping consumers have that choice and be able to differentiate a product that. Uh, 
is indeed grown in a responsible way. And it's interesting to reflect here uh, that while we are all negotiating amongst, our, uh, amongst ourselves, this is really, the planet is not negotiating, right? I think the planet has made a final offer. And the issue is really, um, it's really about respecting the planetary boundaries. We have wonderful examples, uh, be it um, in, like today, 15% of the tea, about 12% of the cocoa, five of the coffee. Uh, we're working with cattle. We started working in, in palm oil. We see a very uh, interesting and positive impact looking at increased productivity uh, and, and protection of soil, enrichment of soil. So really working to uh, bring carbo carbon into the soil and off atmosphere. Uh, and also in terms of uh, water, access to potable water for, for um, rural communities as well as treatment of, of and, and management of waste uh, water. So it's, a, it's, a, it's great work that it's doing, uh, that we are doing, not only with companies, but with uh, uh, governments, and really seeing a lot that can be accomplished through these public-private partnerships. Uh, and uh, really important to get the guidance from countries and INDCs on their goals. And one thing that we would like to see uh, that that uh, we if 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 we could change or an improve improvement that could be made here is really on more specificity on the 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 piece related to land use practices and to landscapes. What is the percentage of the goal that is related to that? And more specificity on the ways in which it each country would like to achieve those uh, goals. Okay, so a lot more definition to slightly vague, uh, a certain vagueness now in the, in the text. Exactly, That's like it. if you okay. don't know exactly, it, it's much harder to get uh, anywhere if you don't know where you are going and I think it lacks some, we okay. think it lacks some from from those that we have reviewed and analyzed, they and and there are some like Liberia, Ecuador, Costa Rica have a little more specificity in them, but I think overall that's that's our take. Gotcha. Now I got the sense from Emil's question that uh, we didn't really do justice to the agroecology question. Uh, I wonder, Sunny, you know, um, uh, do you think we're beyond? Uh, how can I put this? Do you feel that we're beyond the time when the notion of an agroecological agro approach is perhaps seen as a little left of center and a little unidealistic? You know, uh, have we reached a point where the orthodoxy is shifting and there's more consensus in this space, or is there still? Do you still sense some differences of views out there and on the paradigm, at least, on what's best for agriculture? Please. Uh, I, th I think most of us saw an article in The Guardian the other day which said that uh, we've lost about 30% of our arable land in the last 40 years, which was a stunning statistic. I mean, we all know that uh, China, for example, is losing 0 0.6, 0.7% of its arable land each year as a result of urbanization and everything else. Uh, but that number was quite stunning, and it was basically talking about the rich uh, topsoils or the good to average topsoils being lost due to intensive agriculture. So whether uh, uh, going to zero till or low till agriculture, less input intensive, intensive agriculture, whether it will be positive for the economics of the farmer, in the long run, I think there is enough studies and evidence to show that a balanced approach can result in better economics for the farmer. So I think the incentives to get that done is really not there at this point in time. So if you're looking for short-term gains, then I think the input-intensive way is uh, probably the most easy way to do it, but that's not sustainable in the wrong run. But if you want to uh, really look at making it more sustainable, then I think the incentives have to be there, and that's why the question that the lady raised earlier was also very important, 
So who is going to pay for this? And the question is really to each of us in this room. Are we as consumers willing to pay for it? Right? And that's where it starts. Then are the consumer goods companies, which for example are making these products with the food ingredients sourced from agricultural produce, are they willing to pay up to their suppliers? And they have to put the money where the mouth is. If they're not willing to do it, then it's not going to change or happen. Uh, and it is not necessary that by putting a carbon tax, the only party or the only uh, participant in the value chain who will get hit is the farmer. That's not uh, really necessary. Uh, and that's why I think it's very important to be very clear about what the incentives are. And the frustrating thing about objectives and targets that we have in the INDCs or what is finally going to be the outcome of the COP talks itself is we are all um, uh, sort of uh, uh, obsessed about it. But for me, as a, as a private sector participant, it is less than 10% of the ball game. 90% of the ball game is how the hell do you go and implement all of this stuff? What are the implementation pathways? Who are the guys who are going to execute this on the ground? And there is really no attention or focus. And that is why even if you achieve any of these goals and objectives and get a consensus on all of that, the prospect of that being executed and implemented, and if you look at the SDG goals, goal 17 is all about how do you improve implementation. The issue with the Millennium Development Goals is private sector participation was almost negligent. And it is not PPP, it is not just public-private partnerships, it's PPPP. It is public, private, plural society. If the NGOs are not involved, it's not going to work, right? And in all of this, there's an imbalance. It's either public or plural, but it's never been public, plural, and private society all working hand in hand. And if you're not going to get that, and we're not going to have clear implementation pathways, all this is a waste of time. Thank you, Sunny. Can I ask a follow-up question? I, and this is something I struggled with um, when we were setting up uh, this program in, in, in IFAD I mentioned called ASAT, where we were trying to bring eight million smallholder farmers you know, into a space where they're far more climate resilient at the same time as trying to help them enter markets uh, and shift from subsistence agriculture. And there was this perceived or real dilemma that uh, the vast gains of market entry, that's great, and that was something to be aiming for. What about the risk that market entry may actually uh, lead to monocropping?